Welcome, everybody. Uh, hello to all the coaches and participants out there joining us on today's webinar. Good afternoon to those of you in the Eastern and Central time zones, and good morning if you're joining us out West. Appreciate you taking the time to join us for today's webinar. My name is Jeff Langner. I'm the Sports Field Business Manager at Turfus Athletics. I've been with the company about 13 years now, and I'm joined today by Chris Ball, who is a former professional groundskeeper and is now a regional sales manager for us out of the Carolinas. Turfus, uh, our history goes back a long time in the sports field industry, a little bit more than 50 years. We've been a leading manufacturer of infield conditioners, turf conditioners, and clay products for field maintenance. And throughout our history, our focus has been on improving safety and playability of sports fields through educational events, consultation, and working closely with coaches, groundskeepers, volunteers, and field managers to improve maintenance techniques on fields at all levels of play. Our products are widely adopted at all levels from the professional down to schools and municipalities. With the ABCA, we've been a partner now for more than 20 years, and that includes our sponsorship of the annual Field Maintenance Awards, educational content that we provide both through the annual conference and through webinars like these, and we work to be a resource for coaches all across the country. It's been our pleasure to join you all at the trade show each year and throughout the coaching clinics and webinars that have been held throughout the history of the organization. For Turfus Athletics, 2018 was a transformative year for us following the acquisition of Southern Athletic Fields, which expanded our reach both in terms of the product uh, mix in our line and the number of people that have joined us on the team. I want to talk just briefly about the parent company that owns Turfus Athletics. Profile Products is a leader in the green industry with a focus on products and solutions to help manage soils, promote effective water management, and create sustainable sites. Our products are used across golf courses, landscapes, sports fields, and a number of markets that focus on erosion control and vegetative establishments. Our focus and commitment has been to research and testing, product development, educational events and seminars like these, industry support, and partnerships. Within the sports field industry, we partner with a number of organizations, including coaching organizations, professional turf manager associations, various leagues, and youth organizations. And today is to stay focused on education, to provide this webinar in lieu of hands-on field maintenance, but to share techniques that you can employ at your facility. Our focus throughout our history and throughout our education is to always look at safety first as the top priority, and everything that we do has that objective in mind. As we go throughout this session, you'll have an opportunity to hear from a professional groundskeeper on helpful tools and techniques that you may consider implementing at your facility this coming season. We'll talk about best practices, especially in the fall season, that will help give you a leg up when the spring season comes. We'll talk about understanding your field from a composition standpoint and how the infield mix in particular shapes the level of play on the field and what you need to do from a maintenance standpoint. And then we'll talk about new tools and resources that we can offer that help make your field maintenance program more effective. So at this time, it's my pleasure to turn things over to the featured speaker today, Chris Ball. Well, thanks, Jeff, and, and welcome, everybody. Um, I don't get a chance to be a, a featured speaker very much, so this is the first first chance I've had to do an event like this, but uh, I've uh, been looking forward to it all week. Um, just kind of want to run down my background a little bit um, on, and kind of how I got into, into facilities and field maintenance and things like that. Um, as you can see, I do not have a degree in a, you know, a turf grass science degree or a horticulture degree. My degree is in public administration and parks and recreation administration. Uh, I attended the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, graduated in, 1980, in 1998. Um, I went to actually play baseball uh, for Coach Mike Gasky, and after my freshman year, decided that it was, not, uh, it was not in the cards for me to continue playing and ended up staying uh, with the uh, baseball program as a, a student assistant, administrative assistant now. I guess in college, everybody has a director of baseball ops. So that's kind of like what I was going through school. Uh, so I, I attained my degree and um, through, through, the, through the three or four years uh, prior uh, with the baseball program, we had, a, we had a unique situation. We actually practiced at a local high school 
and we played at a uh, at, at then it was the oldest active minor league ballpark in the country, uh, War Memorial Stadium. And so part of my detail was to get the get the practice facility ready on a daily basis, and then go out and help the uh, the head groundskeeper uh, at, at War Memorial Stadium prepare the field for. Uh, for all of our games and things like that. By about my senior, uh, junior, by about my end of my junior year, into my senior year, um, Mel Lanford was his name. Mel would basically, if we had a weekend series, Mel would throw me the keys and show up back on Sunday after the series. So I really developed a love and appreciation for working on and caring for fields. Um, so that led me to, um, to, to kind of get involved in professional baseball a little bit. Uh, Kinston, North Carolina had a, uh, IA affiliate for the Cleveland Indians, the Kinston Indians. So I was an intern there for two summers. Um, when, uh, when I graduated, I was uh, in route to grad school, and we, uh, the university built a new stadium on campus. Uh, so I got, uh, uh, ended up taking the job as the facility manager for the new baseball stadium uh, and, and uh, getting my uh, grad school paid for uh, by working for the state. I kind of got uh, got tired of the college the, the college life and was ready to spread my wings a little bit. I went to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, um, and became the head groundskeeper for Riverside Stadium um, for a couple of years. Uh, did was kind of a fish out of water. I'm I'm originally from the eastern part of North Carolina, so it's kind of a fish out of water. And decided to move back to Greensboro. I took a job with the uh, with the city of Greensboro as a supervisor of athletic fields. I, I oversaw about 50 fields, care maintenance about 50 fields. Uh, and then I got a call from, um, from a, a good friend of mine who was leaving the Myrtle Beach Pelicans, the Class A affiliate then of the Braves. And, um, you know, he asked me if I knew anybody that wanted to, uh, that, that, that he could call and apply for the job. So I said, yeah, you, you give me a couple of days and I'll shoot you back some names. And about 20 minutes later, I called him back and said, I'd really be interested. You know, what would be better than living at the beach and, um, you know, getting, getting involved in the Braves organization, things like that. So I ended up in Myrtle Beach for, uh, for nine or 10 years and had a great, great early part of my career there. Um, and with my, uh, relationship with the Braves, they built a new stadium here in Gwinnett in 2010. And I joined, uh, joined the, the Gwinnett Braves, the AAA franchise, uh, in 2011 and, uh, had, you know, six or seven great, great years here. In fact, I'm, I'm actually traveling. I'm out on the road this week, so I'm actually in the Atlanta area, and I'm sitting in the suite looking at the stadium right now. It's getting ready to go uh, undergo a uh, uh, a sod renovation. So uh, I joined Southern Athletic Fields uh, in Turfus in 2017, um, and have have really enjoyed kind of giving back to uh, giving back to, this, to 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 the, all the field managers that I've worked with in the past, younger field managers, coaches. Um, college guys, things like that. And, uh, and then earlier this year, I was, uh, I, I had enough points and passed a couple of certification exams to become a certified sports field manager through the, uh, the national STMA association, um, uh, which, you know, was kind of a culmination of a, of a lot of good years in baseball. So anyway, so we're going to kind of start, start off here. Uh, there's a picture of the, the field. My last year in Myrtle beach, uh, is BBT coastal field. Uh, oh, just a beautiful, wonderful little uh, A-ball facility there that sits right in the heart of Myrtle Beach. And um, we, being in the Braves organization, you know, you got the playoffs going on right now. Um, we had a lot of guys that are involved coming through there, uh, involved in the playoffs that are coming through there. Uh, but the, the stadium was owned by the city, and we, we leased the stadium from them. We were, uh, I was, I was um, the head groundskeeper for the first two years, and then, Beyond that, uh, became the uh, the longest one of the longest titles in minor league baseball as a senior director of ballpark operations and sports turf management uh, in Myrtle Beach. So, there's the beach. Uh, here's my facility that I managed in uh, Lawrenceville, Georgia, Cool Ray Field, the AAA affiliate for the Braves. Uh, this stadium uh, is owned by the county, uh, but the, I was actually an employee of the Atlanta Braves. Uh, so that was that was a really uh, uh, really a good step in my career to come come here again a brand new facility in 2010 uh that has all the bells and whistles on it uh interior for the for the player development guys and then we have a uh, we had a, a first class 100 percent sand base field with 419 bermuda um just a really 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 nice place um 2013 
Uh, I, I give my staff a lot of credit. 2013, I was the International League Sports Turf Manager of the Year. Um, 2000, 2007, 2010, and 2013, uh, I was the National Sports Turf Manager of the Year uh, for minor league baseball in my classifications. Um, so we're going to get into a lot of the nuts and bolts kind of it starting now and uh, we're, we're going to talk a lot about more, you know, some moisture management and things, things that you guys can do. But there's just a, there's a good shot of a daily practice that we did uh, watering our infield skin, our mounds, and our plates on a, uh, on a on a on a daily 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 basis. So um, small decisions have a big impact in your maintenance program. Uh, find products and solutions that help to improve your field maintenance. Um, Every product you choose, whether it's a, it's it's one of our products, infield conditioner, mound clay, whether it's fertilizer, uh, whether it's a it's a you know a, an, an herbicide with new technology that's out, um, helps make your job easier. Uh, know which products to use, how to use them, and uh, and and what products you use to make the biggest impact, and then also uh, getting the biggest bang for your buck. Um, so, innovate, and try new things. Um, I being in Myrtle Beach, we're the we're the capital of golf. Uh, you know, the the we had 120 some odd golf courses. So without having a turf degree, I had to really learn from a lot of people smarter than myself. Um, one of one of the things that I really really got a uh, got a really good grip on was airification. And airification is such an important cultural practice um, to relieve relieve the compaction in your turf. Uh, to give air to the to the roots and the plant, the the grass plant, um, and then incorporating sand after you uh, as a top dressing after you airify. Well, we um, we inherited a little bit of a of a of a messy kind of soil profile uh, after the first season here in Gwinnett, and I went back to some of my golf course buddies, and they one of them said, "Have you ever thought about top dressing?" Uh, very, very light, but frequent amounts and pushing that sand down into the root zone with your air fire. So we started this practice, um, in 2012 and have, and I continued to do it throughout the rest of my career here. And what it did is it really, uh, really assisted in getting the organic matter delineated out of our, um, out of our soil profile. So I heard a long time ago in another turf grass, uh, symposium that dilution is the solution. So a lot of, a lot of uh, sand, sand is a magical, magical thing and, and, uh, does a lot for you. But we, we ended up, um, just about every time we aerified, we throw a light top dressing of sand down, uh, pounded it in with our airification tides and really, really helped us, um, make some, make some improvements. Um, big thing is to have a plan for the unexpected. Um, this is a really good shot of a, of a storm, um, in July, uh, July 4th, one year that, that dumped a pile of rain on us. So there's the radar picture. July 4th for us in minor league baseball is one of the biggest, uh, the biggest days of the year. We usually sell the stadium out, have a huge fireworks show, have all kinds of events. Um, this one caught me with my pants down, literally. Uh, we had four and a half inches of rain July 2nd. Uh, we were on the road until July 4th and, and came home, or we're coming home to a 10,500 uh, seat full stadium on July 4th. So we had four and a half inches of rain on July 2nd, untarped. And I know a lot of you guys don't have the, have the ability to, to tarp. Uh, we do. So I really, you know, this was, this is a big moneymaker for us in, in the business. And, you know, we, we had to deal with this. So kind of walk you through a little bit. What we, what we've done, we see a lot of issues uh, on, on infields and where, where coaches or, or field managers will actually lose their grade because every time it rains, they take their infield machine or their tractor out and they, they just absolutely tear it up and throttle it because they got to get on it as soon as possible. Now, I had a full day to get this, to get this right. So what we started doing with our, uh, with our bow rakes, we just we, we cut the infield open one way to let, to let the air really start to work. As we could walk out there without making a mess, we'd go further and further and further. So... You can see the see the pictures here, and you can see the uh, the infield, the the top dressing, the cal sign, uh, the turf is in here that's that's already started to dry out. This is not new material. This is us letting nature take its course. 
Um, this is July. This is July third at two o'clock. Um, excuse me a second. Uh, as you can see, we've gotten further and further along of opening the infield up just by hand without using any machinery. This is July 3rd at 4.33 p.m. And if you could zoom in on a picture, you'd see the outfield wall clock. It says 4.33 p.m. So I'm trying to keep it legit and tell you the truth here. But you can see how the top dressing material is starting to dry out along the edges of the infield and to where we're starting to get a lighter color to build, to build back in the, in, in the infield skin. Again, this is all done by hand. We have not used any machinery. So we, we, we strive to maintain that grade all season long. And the more equipment and the more material and clay you move around, the worse and worse your grade is going to get. And then this is July 4th at 10 o'clock in the morning. We still had a little, a little bit of wetness, but now we were able to get a machine on it, drag it out a little bit, and roll it. Uh, it's 2 o'clock. And 4:30. So um, that was kind of the kind of the we we ended up playing the game obviously that night. We had a beautiful July 4th and, and got through it. Um, so uh, one thing that that uh, I've given several talks to to groups of field managers. You know, a lot of times we don't step back, take a look at what we've done, and say, you know what, this is really cool. We've really got a we've really tightened our facility up here with things we've done. You know, we've got a good program going. We've got the kids involved, uh, you know, for pride of ownership. You know, look at your facility every once in a while and, 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 and kind of praise yourself. So uh, take a step back and breathe every once in a while. Uh, your local vendors, uh, whether it's your turf and ornamental distributors, your fertilizer guys, your, um, the guy that comes and services your lawnmower once a year, um, your, uh, your, your, your guys that you buy your infield mix from, your turfers from, uh, they've got incredible value for you, not only in the problem that you're trying to solve, um, you know, with their presence, but they'll also take a look around the facility, help you out if, 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 the, and they, if they see anything else, uh, they'll let you know, this is, this was a case that I had, uh, I had a, a disease on my Bermuda called Pythium, and it comes from leaving the tarps on too long in the heat and in the hot, quaggy kind of months it, it, it starts to rot your roots and is very very um very very detrimental to your your plant population so i didn't even notice this was going on he was walking out in the outfield and he said come take a look at this so diagnosed it with pythium sprayed it out and uh moved on uh, your vendors are help that they're paid to help and educate you on the latest trends uh technological advances in in, in chemical chemistry uh, in, in fertilizer, in, with your, your equipment, with your infield mixes, with your mound clays, with your calcine clays, you know, using a color or anything like that. So they, they, they're, they're a very, very good resource. Um, they can also help you troubleshoot your problems. So um, we, had, uh, we had an issue where we got a uh, load of warning track material from a, from a vendor one year that had a lot of, a lot of clay in it. And it turned out that the the truck driver had turned right around from a from taking a load of infield mix to go get a, getting a uh, getting a load of warning trap material and called our vendor. They got it right for us. So um, again, sometimes old maintenance practices are still some of the best practices. Doing a lot of things by hand, uh, using using your 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 kids and your team to take pride and ownership in their facility, uh, things like that. So. Uh, obviously, with the onset of, of the new technology that we have in our pockets every day, um, just a couple of ideas for you on some weather apps. Um, Weather.gov is a great one. That's that's NOAA. Uh, Radar Scope is uh, is like ten bucks a ten bucks one shot deal. Uh, Stormfield, Rain Aware, and then your local news app. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see it, but there's a little dot right in the middle of the screen. That's the stadium that we GPS into this radar. And because these radars are so, so good, um, it, it helped us actually finish a ball game one night. Again, the radar scope's 10 bucks a year. It's, I, I'm out of the, out of the professional groundskeeping business now, but I still have it on my phone and use it daily, daily, daily. Um, you can't prepare for everything. This uh, actually, we found this guy rolled up in our tarp 
after sitting all off season. And uh, it, it was uh, it was a shock to our system. Uh, we got a lot of laughs out of it. Uh, another resource of value to you is state agriculture extension offices. Um, a lot of times, their their um, their agents. You can set an appointment with their agents if you're having problems with your turf. They'll come out. They'll take a soil sample for you. Make recommendations on fertilizer, on lime applications, on a lot of different things. If you've got diseases you can't get rid of, if you've got bugs or or grubs or or army worms or cutworms. They can come and diagnose these problems for you. And most of the time, their visits to come to your facility are for free. Excuse me. Um, expect the unexpected. Uh, this was a, I found this picture several years ago. This was a senior prank that, uh, that some kids did at their local high school. They planted a tree right between the mountain and the plate. And uh, I, I think this is an awesome, hilarious picture. All right. So get ahead of the game. Uh, six six big steps for, for going into 2020 season. Um, the big thing we always, you know, we get a lot of questions on when should we laser grade our infield? Should we laser grade our infield every year? You know, if you can raise the money and you have the means uh, and you have a budget to do it, absolutely get it done. Um, it eliminates low spots. It can help with, with drainage. Um, it, you know, a lot of times you get – um, where areas at at uh, at first and second base and third, it helps to, it helps fill those low areas in. It also uh, helps with positive drainage uh, of moving water off of, off of your off of your field, uh, and, it, and it also acts as kind of a refreshment for your infield mix every year as well. Because typically, when somebody comes into laser grade your um, your infield, they actually uh, will rototill it and um, kind of bring back and mix up the material that you've, uh, you've had out, uh, out there all year. So another big one is edging your infield. Um, you know, one, one thing that we try to do in, in throw ball was when we put the field to bed in November, we tried to get it prepared and get it to the point to where we were two days away. We could come out at any time, two days away and play baseball. Our proximity to Atlanta and Gwinnett, we're 45 minutes from, from SunTrust Park. And we would have guys that would come during the winter or during the early spring before they go to spring training and come and work out. So I couldn't have bad lips. I couldn't have, you know, overgrown areas on the field or couldn't have it, you know, just couldn't have it out of sorts because I got multi-million dollar guys coming out to, to work out. And, you know, as, as baseball and softball become year-round sports in a lot of areas, um, it's really important to try to keep it as, as, as playable as you can just about all year round. Uh, clean and freshen up your warning track, uh, you know, edge it. And if you've got, uh, if you do have a warning track, add material to it. Um, you know, you can, you can, the, the guys who do your, your infill laser grading can also grade your warning track. Um, excuse me. Uh, protect, protect your turf. A lot of you guys in winter climates, you know, there's a lot of technology out there with growth blankets uh, where if you've had to overseed and you get really cold, um, you can you can cover your uh, cover your your infield or your 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 foul ground or even your entire field with growth blankets. Um, make repairs to your mountain plate areas. A lot of times we'll go to facilities in the fall or the winter or the early spring that haven't been touched since their last event in September, October, and there's a big hole in the mound where the pitchers have damaged and there's, you know, the, the batter's boxes are worn out. Do yourself a favor and go ahead and fix those two areas and, and get them game ready, get them ready to go. And even if you, if you don't have the, the means for area tarps for those areas, go to Lowe's and get blue tarps and cut them. Just try to keep that clay covered. Uh, it's just one thing that, that, you know, when you guys are in a rush to get going in the spring, um, if you're doing all this work by yourself, uh, it, it's just, it, it's a, it's a time saver. And two, what it also does is it helps that clay set up all winter long and really get firm and compacted in there. So you have a really nice pitching and hitting surface come the springtime when the weather turns. Um, also another, another thing that, that, that we like to preach and that we like that we see quite a bit is, um, 
different infield mixes in different regions of the country in the Carolinas and in Georgia, we have really, really sandy mixes that, that are available to parks and recreation guys, to coaches, kind of the lower, the lower budget stuff. Companies like ours and reps like me will come out, assess what you have and actually take a sample, show you what you've got, your sand, your sand and clay ratio, sand, silt and clay ratio, and then make a recommendation to you on a product that we have or you can get, you know, locally or something like that that will actually help, uh, help your infield and help your, help your infield mix. So here's a couple of pictures of laser grading. Um, I'll say this in laser grading that a lot of times your, your contractor will finish, uh, finish laser grading and leave. You'll walk out there and you'll see a little bit of, of water on top of it. The first time that it happens, you actually need to go back in there after they're done and, a lot of times, add your conditioner, nail drag it in, roll it a couple times because it, it takes it takes a little bit of dragging and maintenance to really to really finish off the laser grade um, to get you playable. So that's uh, just another another little tip. Hey, Chris, Clean up your edges. Yeah. Real quick, ahead, I wanted Jeff. to jump in because we've had a couple of questions, and I think you're going to get into lips specifically in a minute. So I know that was one that came up. If, if somebody does have a question, you're able to ask those on the left side of your screen and we'll try to address as many as we can. One in particular that came up on laser grading, I know part of the reason we preach doing it in the fall is to give the field time to settle back in. And you mentioned rolling it. If somebody does wait until the spring and goes out and laser grades, how much time do they have to give it? Uh, and maybe the same question would be true about if they rototill a field and, and really disturb that soil, how long do you have to give it before you can put athletes out on there? Right. Well, I guess the biggest thing is once, once, it's, uh, once it's been rototilled, you, you've got to find a way to get it compacted again and, and roll it, uh, roll it down and get it, you know, get it smooth. Um, you know, one thing that, that, that we, we did quite a bit when af after a laser grade for us is we would, we would kind of take the, take the approach of we've got, you know, we've got a couple of days before we've got athletes on it. So we kind of go through our normal practices of watering it, um, like for, for, for games or for workouts, letting that water penetrate and get into the, into the entire soil profile. So with us, it was, you know, we had four inches of clay uh, or four to six inches of clay to really get that, to let that water get down in there and, and, and get your, get your, get, get the moisture correct through that entire clay column. Um, uh, so the, the other thing is now we have had to, uh, we've done it both ways. We've laser graded in the fall and I've laser graded in the spring. Um, you know, once, once you, once you finish, once you finish grading, You've really got to start working your infield like you would on uh, on a daily or weekly basis. Um, but we've 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 put athletes on it in you know in in three days, two or three days. So you just got to make sure that um, you know and test it. Hit a couple of fungos across it to see if it's cheating up on you. Um, you know, check your check your 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 infield amendment um, levels. One one rule of thumb that we had on our infield amendment uh, or our top dressing. Um, I, I know I saw, I think I saw a question earlier about the thickness of, of what we applied and we would take our, our, our drag, our six foot drag that we pull by hand during the mid inning games. And if we saw that we had calcine, the calcine material in the last two links of the, of the drag of the six foot drag that we, we knew we were, we were correct. If we went a little over, that was fine. If we were under, we added more material, but the last two links in a chain drag, you should be you should be pulling material. Um, you should have material in those two. Uh, so and that that, that we, we were between a, a like an eighth and a quarter of an inch most of the time initially, and then through the through the season we'd add more on a daily basis. But that's that's kind of a good rule of thumb. If you if you're pulling a six foot drag and you've got um, you've got infield material in those last two links, that's a that's a pretty good rule of thumb. So and then. Um, you know, I don't know if everybody has the ability to uh, wash their edges, uh, but you can see the pit, the photo on the left that I'm looking at is with our uh, our one inch hose um, that's that was in a quick coupler behind our mound. We did this every time the team left town. What that does is that it gets a lot of the clay and the sediment out of that lip area, um, 
pushes it back into the infield. And then also that, that, that edge area where you, you water, you, you've got all that excess water, it gets moisture down into that clay as well. So, and, um, you know, so, so clean up, do that if you can. If you if you've got a garden hose, do it with a garden hose. If you've got a, a leaf blower, get that material back into your infield. It doesn't belong in the grass, and that's gonna that's gonna help you help you maintain that 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 really good transition. Uh, and then I would also clean add up. real ahead, quick. Go. I would add that too because I know I've been at a number of fields where they're saying that the infield is low and they want to add infield mix, and it turns out what's happened is that a lip has built up, so the lip is just high. But when that material gets pulled back in there, you end up kind of back at grade. So I think one of the knee-jerk reactions we see a lot is to try to go out and just continue to add more infield mix. And a lot of times it's not necessary. You know, your mix is all there. It's just worked its way into the turf grass. Right. Yeah, that, that, that's a good point. That's a real good point. And, you know, a, a lot of times, you know, over the years of, of continually putting putting infield mix in, you know, you, you'll get to a certain point where you actually you're, you're the, 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 the company that comes in laser is, is coming to laser grade you may tell you that it's time to take it out. So you may end up having to take a truckload or two off of it instead of, um, instead of adding. So, and, and a good company that, that laser grade will use a, will use a laser and a transit on the back of their, on the back of their, tra- their, their box blade. Uh, but they, they should take grade measurements and grade shots for you before they do it. So, um, so that's another, another thing to look at. Um, to us, to me, edging is such an important, was such an important piece. It, it helped, it, it, it always maintained the transition from, from dirt to dirt to turf. And if you do it often enough, it really doesn't take a lot of time. Um, we, we, we try to do it about every, you know, every, I don't know, every six, six, eight days. Um, even when the team was gone, we still edged it. Um, because and in, in professional baseball, this is our, this is the field is one of our biggest marketing tools. People coming in and out of the stadium to buy tickets, or what have you. So we always try to keep it uh, as, as best you can. And then, you know, instead of, instead of having to go out in February and run a sod cutter and cut, you know, 16 inches of, of bluegrass or ryegrass or Bermuda runners off that grew all fall, you know, if you can, if you can, you know, consistently maintain that edging around your field, one, it's going to save you time in the spring, but two, it's also, uh, also helps with safety going into the, into the, your plant season. So, and it's, it's another really, really good project to get the team involved. One more, one more thought on that too is, um, I'm going to go back to this other slide. You can see the orange wheel. When you guys are edging your diamond on your infield, um, please, 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 please use a string line. Um, that, that it just, it's going to set you apart. It's going to keep it crisp and straight. So, um, reestablish your baselines, your back arc, you know, do things like that in the fall. Uh, a lot of times baselines will get skinnier during the course of the summer as, as the turf grows, reestablish them as you can. There are companies now that can actually come in with them with a, with several different machines and cut lips out, cut high areas out. And most of the time what they're doing is they're cutting clay out. Um, but they, they, you know, you have a chance now to, um, to actually pay to get the lips removed instead of having to, take a side cutter and do it all yourself. So that's another, that's another, another big, big piece of technology. So um, again, main, maintain your lips at all costs. It's, it's the number one issue that we see in, in fields that don't have a staff like mine. Uh, every, every, everywhere, everywhere we go across the country, um, you know, how do I reduce lips? How do I reduce the lips? And, and washing them out, blowing them out, sweeping them out, whatever is a really, really, really big deal. Um, so again, this is a picture with, uh, doing this with a one inch hose, simple shot brooms, uh, will work to move material, uh, when it's dry leaf rakes, um, you know, $20 leaf rakes or $16 leaf rakes, you know, get a couple of them and have your guys do it on a, on a daily basis, just to move all that material that's been kicked up through practice or game back into the skin. Hey, Chris. Uh, Yeah make one other comment on that too, just from a preventative standpoint, because we're talking a lot about what to do once you get the lips. 
Um, but poor dragging techniques are one of the biggest causes. I mean, going too fast on the drag, dragging too close to those edges, that'll start pushing material up. So if you are dragging your field or you have somebody doing it for you, make sure they're taking their time. Hand rake if they can along the, the edges uh, to make sure that material doesn't get pushed up in there. So if you have somebody going too quickly, that's one of the biggest causes for those lips. Uh, and then you have to come back and address them as the season goes on. Yeah, and on that too, you know, I would I would say um, it's 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 a marathon, not a sprint. When you drag, it's not it's not something that can be done in three minutes, going wide open on your your four wheeler, your gator, or your infield machine. It take 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 time to drag your field, uh, and also do not drag it the same way day in and day out. Vary your patterns. I think I've got a, a slide or two in here about this later, but. Vary your patterns. Uh, one day, do really, really tight circles. The next day, do really, really big circles. Uh, long drag it. You know, do, uh, drag it via the entire perimeter. Uh, do figure eights out there. Um, you know, varying those drag patterns will actually help you, you know, cut little high, you know, high areas out and bring material into low areas, things like that. So if you do, if you do the same pattern all the time and you start and stop at the same place at the same time, you're going to create a low spot and a high spot. So, um, you know, we would, we would, it was almost like a, like a, like a sundial on Mondays, we would start at third on Tuesdays. We start at second on Wednesdays. We'd start at, at, um, at first. So just, you know, very where you start and stop too. That's a, that's a, that's a really big deal. So, and start dragging on the dirt. Don't start dragging on your grass, start dragging on your infield dirt. Uh, let me see where it was here. Okay. Talk a little bit about warning tracks. Again, um, you know, get your edges cleaned up. And if you've got any uh, material left over, uh, go ahead and get that put out and get a, get a really nice drag on it. Uh, if, you, if, you have a, if you have the means to order a, a refresher load or two of it, uh, get that out in the fall. That way, when you're not playing and during the winter, all the weather that you have is going to help settle it in. And that's a, uh, that's, that's a big deal, too. That's, that's you know, if you if you come out and try to put a load of warning track material in on a Monday and you're playing on Wednesday, the footing's not going to be great. Uh, again, you can roll that if you if you get a chance and um, uh, go from there. So, and then the the fall and the winter as a, as a time of rest and recovery. I know that again, like I said earlier, baseball baseball especially has become a year round sport. Uh, it, it is here in the southeast. Um, so, um, let it, let it, let it, let it rest a little bit. Uh, there's just a picture of the grow covers that I touched on earlier. Uh, we'll kind of talk a little bit about mound repair and mound play now. Um, obviously you can see that this mound was left over, uh, uncovered over a, a, a fall or a winter. And when they came out in the spring, you, you just got an absolute mess. Your, your, and your, obviously your two biggest areas, um, mound, mound wise are your foothold area up by the pitch and rubber and then your landing zone. And your landing zone, um, is, is going to vary how wide it is based on the, the size of the pitchers you got. To use. Um, packing clays provide safe and playable surfaces for pitchers, batters, and catchers. Uh, we, we have seen in the past that People will take just their infield mix and try to build a mound out of it, the entire thing out of it. And over time, because there's not a high clay, not a, not a high high clay content like there is in, you know, in packing clays and even bricks, uh, the holes tend to be a lot worse and they blow out really bad and uh, are, are are cause for injury. Um, they provide a, a really durable and stable foundation uh, that will actually help you minimize your your divoting and your um, your footholds. Um, the, uh, the, the, the bricks are really good as a foundation. Your bag clays are really good as, as, as a foundation as well, but really, really good for repairing uh, post-game and post-practice, things like that. Uh, and, and another thing I wanted to hit on is that uh, 60 feet, six inches, the distance from the mound to the, from the pitch and rubber to the to home plate is a rule. It's not an advisement. It's a rule. Uh, we, we do see that uh, we have seen instances where we'll see 
60 feet. We'll see 61 foot six inches. Every so often, check check that distance. And uh, and then the other the other thing on that is maintain your grade, your 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 slope on your on your mound. And there there are multiple. We have multiple resources on our website. There are multiple re- resources all over the internet that that talk a lot about grade and how to grade and things like that. So I'm not going to get into a ton of a, a ton about how to grade a mound right now. Just some shots of a mound renovation using bricks. Uh, you'll see the the top the top picture in the middle. That's the area that we recommend to excavate because that's that's your pitching area. Um, you know your your area your your foot area up where the pitcher sets, and then your entire landing zone. And this is just a really good example of um, kind of the, the the process to go through on installing the uh, installing the bricks. Hey Chris, one question yeah. that came up about the mound. I know we preach tarping and covering the mound in some way, not only to keep moisture in, um, but to protect it from rain uh, on off days and things like that. In terms of utilizing conditioner, uh, what do you recommend? This is a question that came in from the audience. What do you recommend in terms of a top dressing? How thick of a layer on a mound or a plate area? Well, I, I think it's the, it's the same. We we looked at it as the same way uh, that that we looked at our infield. Um, you know, if you can, if, if you can get down, if you can't pull that material back with a rake, you don't have enough. You need a uniform coating, you know, an eighth of an inch, a uniform coating on that, on, on those areas. We treat them just like we treat an infield. Um, so does that, does that help at all? Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Um, I'm just trying to think of where to go. Cause I know I've rambled a lot, so I apologize for that. Um, we'll talk, we'll talk a little bit about conditioners. I think Jeff, um, infield conditioners, keep the field, the help, help keep the field moist to help manage your moisture, uh, but not super wet or, or sticky or tacky. Uh, they ha- actually help maintain moisture deep in the infield mix. Um, they can, they can help, uh, help absorb excessive water as far as rain or, um, you know, hose water or anything like that. They, they help keep the infield and the, and the playing surface firm. Uh, they prevent rainouts. Uh, they actually, actually help in ball roll. Um, and they help create safe and playable infields. Um, many, many trade names from many different companies. You have the, the Turfus, our, our Turfus branded products, Southern Athletic Field products, Diamond Pro, Louisville Slugger, Pro's Choice, RS3, and Dura Edge. Uh, but not all conditioners are created equal. Um, just know, know what you're buying, know what size you're buying, know what color you're buying, things like that. And a lot of that's preference. Um, you know, my, my preference was to have a, a uniform particle size like our pro league and our pro league elite. Um, because I just felt that that would give my players the best ball roll, the best, the best, and the best footing. Um, I really wasn't much of a, of a, of a color guy. Uh, but I also, but my color derived from the use of another type of, uh, of conditioner, a vitrified clay or a, uh, a shale product. Uh, and in, in South Carolina and Georgia, we incorporated those products to actually help almost shade our clay because that material sits below your calcine and, uh, can actually help lock in moisture and shade your clay. And again, here's kind of an example. Uh, the photo on the, the the bucket on the left has got calcine clay in it. The bucket on the right has a vitrified or a, a, a shale aggregate product on it. They they actually have two different jobs. As you can see, the calcine actually absorbs the water and holds it. The um, the expanded shale they they only hold a very very small small part of their um, of their weight in water. Calcine clays hold almost all of their weight in water. So you can really see the difference there in, in what the two products are. Jeff, you got anything to add on those? No, I think that's, you know, again, a lot of it just comes back to understanding what the product is doing for you, working with your distributor. If you're in a hot, dry climate, you can get away with some kind of an aggregate. Uh, you know, we have an expanded shale in our line. There are vitrified clays. They are effective for a sliding surface. They can be good as a top dressing, but they're not moisture management tools. And it goes back to the point Chris made early in the presentation that you want to provide tools 
to your facility that are going to make your job easier. Um, a calcined clay, when you get those rain games, it's going to protect that clay a little bit better. It's going to give your athletes a better footing. You're not going to get that same kind of moisture management from an expanded shale or a vitrified clay. So just understanding the use of those two products, and they can work in concert with each other, um, but understanding why you're selecting a certain product is important. Um, you also get different bulk densities between the two. So a, a bag of turfus, for example, or calcined clay, you're going to get more particles in the bag because it has a lower bulk density. When you go and buy a bag of vitrified clay, you get about half of the volume, um, often for the same price. So understanding those differences and uh, your local distributor can help coach you on that as well. All right, I know we've had a couple of questions about um, how much you want to apply. Um, we'll kind of just go over this kind of quickly. Uh, can modif uh, calcine clay can modify a bad infill mix. Uh, mixes that are high in clay or high in silt can be easily managed with, with conditioner actually worked into the clay. Uh, it's my preference to actually uh, every year when we, when we laser graded, we also, we never stripped our material. Uh, we added a look, we added probably a pallet of material every year, 40 bags to, to incorporate in with our infill mix, uh, just so that we've got a consistency with calcine clay all the way through our, our, our clay column. Um, again, a, a preseason application, we would come out with between 60 and 80 bags um, on our surface uh, every, every February. And again, we're a lot different than a lot of you guys are. We actually probably added six to 10 bags a day uh, just to dress up, our, dress up our baselines, make sure we had adequate amount covering the home plate, the home plate area. And then every night when you drag or we, you know, you players take it off on their uniforms. If you have a tarp issue, you pull it off in the outfield in your tarp. So we always, we always freshen it up on a, on a daily basis. Um, it should create, it should create a, a true, you should have a delineation barrier between your infield and your, and the top, the top of the, of the um, amendment surface. So an even, just an even layer uh, is, is, is ideal. Um, I would say if you're, you know, you're, you're, you're shutting your fields down for the, for the winter and, and the northern climates and in the, in the cold climates, um, you can, you can take it off, um, or really, really nail drag it, nail drag it in to get it kind of mixed in with that top layer of the, of the clay so that the wind and the snow melt and the rain and whatever other weather impacts you have, uh, so it stays there and you don't lose it, you know, kind of, kind of protecting your invest investment. Um, many, many types of drags out there on the market. In fact, in the, in the bottom, on the bottom row on the left is the, is the six foot drag. And you can kind of actually see in that picture that there's calcine or, um, top dressing material in those last two drag links that go all the way up and down the drag links. So, that, so that's kind of the ideal, um, the ideal amount. Uh, you've got cocoa mats. You've got cocoa mops for small areas, your baselines and your and your um, your mound area. Um, big finish brooms. We use we use the combination of, of the big finish brooms and the uh, the hand drags when we weren't using our infield machine. And then the the nail drags or nail boards. Um, I think I think our website's got a pretty good uh, a pretty good uh, plan on how to build one of those. Uh, if you have one. Um, I really, really use it to help incorporate that material to help level out high and low areas. Um, that they're, they're, they're a great, great tool. Chris, Again, one I, question. You know, we we yep. get a lot. I've seen it actually a couple uh, times here today. In terms of how often to nail drag and the depth even of a nail drag, can you just talk real briefly about what you're trying to accomplish with the nail drag and also maybe just touch on, hey, when is too wet to be out there either with a nail or even a metal drag? What are the downsides of trying to drag a field when it's too wet? Yeah, I, I think I, I touched on that real early on as far as when it's too wet. Um, you, you're, you're actually, you're, you're moving way, way too much clay around, too much of your base material around. Uh, if you, if you put, if you step on your infield and you're drawing up water as you walk through there, it's too wet to, um, to get out there with, with a nail drag or a, or a, an infield machine with, with your, with your scarifiers. Um, what, after you play, you get, you get cleat marks, you get divots, you get chunks that come up. 
Um, you create high areas and you create low areas. So nail dragging actually, it actually works as kind of a mini laser grade on a, on a daily or weekly basis. We use the nail drag af just about after every, every ball game the next morning uh, because our, 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 our moisture was ideal at that point to really fine tune to get the divots and, and the cleat marks and all that smooth back out. Also, you create chunks and you create, you know, you create little pieces and chips and shards of clay um, when, when your players are running. So that also helps break those down. Um, so does that, does that help, Jeff? Yep, that's great. Thanks. Okay. Um, again, very, varying your drag patterns uh, to me is, is a really, really big thing. Uh, just like, just like kind of the nail dragging. Um, you know, if, if you, if you, if you go the same direction and the same speed all the time, uh, you're, you're going to create problems for yourself. Um, let me see here. Uh, I know some of you guys in the, in the, um, in the colder areas of the year have to blow your irrigation systems out. Uh, so don't, don't forget about that. That way, when you need to start to water your turf or a lot of, a lot of you folks may actually use your irrigation system to water your infield dirt. I uh, recommend blowing it out if you can in the fall or the winter so that you don't end up with a lot of cracked pipes and a really a lot of problems. Um, again, you know, uh, moisture, I haven't really been able to, to, to get on that dissertation very much, but moisture is the, is the key to a good infield. It, it, there is, there is a level that you need to, you need to be at with your skin, um, that you, you don't, you don't bounce baseballs and bowling balls off of it. That's, you know, obviously making it way too hard. Um, and I know, I know a lot of times that, you know, you'll, you'll come back to your field in the spring and it'll be really hard because you've had a dry winter. Um, you know, but, but moisture on a daily basis on your infield, infield material is, is a big, big deal. Um, not just on your, you know, on your, on your infield surface. On your batter's boxes, your your, your um, you know a lot of the game is played at home plate, especially on your pitcher's mounds. Um, every time you every time you fix your mound, put a good coat of good coat of water on it and cover it. Covering it is is a big big deal. To show you guys how much we water, that's uh, that's water. That's our morning water at ten o'clock for two for for two o'clock BP. So we actually we puddle our field every morning. Um, you know, based, based on weather conditions to make sure we had adequate moisture throughout that clay column uh, of the infield skin. Um, this was, uh, this was pregame uh, during the ACC tournament in Louisville, Kentucky, several years ago that I went and, uh, I went and helped Tom Nielsen out uh, for that whole tournament. And again, you know, we're, well, you're playing three, four games a day. Uh, you got to get it when you can, and you got to, you got to really, really try to maintain that level in that, in that skin and get it again, get it, try to get it consistent as you can through that entire column. Uh, you can laser grade in the spring, if not in the fall, we touched on that a little bit. There's a, there's a pretty, there's a good picture of a nail of a couple of nail drags for you guys. And again, like I said, there's a lot of good resources on how to build these things, what size nails you use, um, you know, you use chain or rope or, you know, you can make them, you can make them uh, with two, two rows of nails or you can make them with three rows of nails. So it's just dependent upon what, what your, what your preference is. Um, simple tools like a garden tiller along your edges to freshen up your edges and the, uh, your clay edges in the spring work wonders. Um, you know, you can get in there and you're very controlled. Uh, those little manis tillers are phenomenal. I, I would, that's the best 250 bucks I've ever spent. Um, our mounds, and I know you guys don't have the ability to do this a lot because obviously we had a, you know, we had a staff of, of four or five guys on a daily basis. But we graded our mounds every other home stand, and we installed new rubbers two times a year. Um, you know, we pitching rubbers they 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 get they they can become a safety hazard. They get chunks out of them. They get they get cleat marks in the middle of them. Um, so pay attention to those. You know, they can they can they can actually get slick too. So I do not recommend, and I we see this a lot. I don't recommend painting your pitching rubber uh, because a lot of the paints that you use on a uh, on for that. Um, are, are, they, they get really, really slick when they get wet. And if you're playing a night game during the spring or summer, you're going to have a lot of dew. So 
they, they tend to get slick. Um, again, I, I told you guys that we, um, you know, we tried to put out six to 10 bags of, uh, of conditioner on a, on a daily basis. And we, we didn't just go out there, crack a bag open, dump it and rake it. We actually, you have, you have a mini top dresser in a drop spreader. You also have a mini top dresser that you can use in a, in a broadcast spreader. And what you're doing is you're putting that material out at, at an even rate and an even pace. And it's very controlled so that you don't have a pile here. A pile there, a pile here, a pile there. Um, and you know, we we strive for this in the in the ninth inning every night. You know, you can see by that picture how very little holes, nothing's really deep. There's not a lot of chunky ch chunky play areas coming out. So that um, that's kind of what we strive for. Oh, we always go the extra mile. We added a little cal sign in our boxes. Uh, we we had a. Uh, a G logo made up that was a piece of wood covered by ash by by astroturf. We put that down before we watered, and it looked you know it's it's a it's a great little stencil, really easy to do. Uh, I have to pick on myself here for a minute. Um, this was my first game in Gwinnett uh, back in 2011. Uh, I ch I chalked the uh, foul line on the wrong side of the string line, so we make mistakes too. So. Uh, Here's a good example I saw a couple of years ago for you guys in the northern climates. Uh, this coach actually took the time to make us uh, like an edging, like a bed edging uh, on from his skin to his his uh, his grass infield, so that when the wind blows and 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 he has snow melt and runoff and all that stuff, all of his his clay material and his his calcine material did not end up in his grass. It might be excessive, but I thought it was a, just a tremendous tremendous little little uh, tool to use. Um, let's see here, you know, and everybody's got different maintenance abilities. Everybody's got different, uh, maintenance budgets. Everybody's got different equipment, make the best out of the tools you have available. This was actually in, uh, in, in South Korea. Um, so, you know, this guy's riding a little moped dragging his infield. Um, so, you know, make the best out of the tools you have available to you. Um, I saw this a couple of years ago. I thought this was priceless for you guys that play, have a lot of summer ball in your facilities. Keep your pictures on the uh, on, on the mound circle. There's nothing wrong with painting it. That paint will go, that paint will grow out in a couple of weeks. So keep them on the dirt. Um, let's see here. Use string lines when you're running. You're you're, uh, you're putting your foul lines out. Obviously, protect what you can with you with your protectors and things like that. Um, and then the goal is uh is for my goal always every year was to have my facility look as good as it did opening day which is a picture there the september 15th during the playoffs so chris with just yeah, a couple of minutes left i know there have been some other questions that have come up along the way i want to encourage people if they have an opportunity feel free to reach yeah. out to chris directly i'm going to put his information up on the screen here including his email address cball at profileproducts.com uh, we certainly appreciate the good questions and conversation and, and uh, hope to have a chance to talk with a lot of you more after today's session. And we certainly look forward to seeing you at the ABCA show as well. One other plug I wanted to put in uh, is that we started earlier this year a Turfus Grounds Crew. Uh, it's an opportunity for you to sign up for product information, industry news, upcoming events. And it's really meant to be a widespread network of coaches, groundskeepers, field managers. Our distributors are a part of that network as well. You can sign up at TurfusGroundsCrew.com. Follow us on social media at hashtag TurfusGroundsCrew. Uh, we love to continue sharing tips and techniques like you saw today. Um, and again, this webinar has been recorded. It will be available at abcavideos.org, and we'll have it on our website as well. And uh, certainly encourage you and invite you to take a look at that again and uh, let us know if there's anything further we can help with as you uh, finish up your fall season and look ahead towards spring. So thank you again to everybody who participated today, and uh, good luck in the coming season. Yeah, thanks for having me, and, and I hope you guys got a little bit out of it. Um, again, there's my contact information. Uh, please feel free to email me or call me. I will, uh, I'll try to respond, and uh, if, you're in, if you're in the Carolinas, uh, I'll be glad to, glad to come and see you. So thank you guys for your time.